1 John chapter 3 in verse 9 it says whoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God so one of the things about the scripture is like first firstly it's really powerful it says whoever is born of God cannot sin okay and he, because he's born of God he does not sin but if you see a few scriptures earlier in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6 it says Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither knows him. Now, that is where I, the power lies and that is where it came to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9. It's talking about how abiding in him removes all consciousness of sin. It removes the consciousness of what sin does, what sin is about, about uh, living life outside of God and that is where the root of sin lies living outside of relationship with the father so it says those who abide in him they have no concept of sin they have no imagination of sin they have no consciousness of sin so what is sin like go back to what the definition of sin is right in Romans chapter 14 verse uh, 23 uh, it says and the second part of 23 it, the, it, it talks about anything that is not of faith is sin in other words Anything you do that does not require you to trust God, believe God, depend on God or abide in God is sin. In other words, God not being a part of what you are doing, God not being a part of your life, God not being in relationship with you or you being separated from him in consciousness is what gives rise to you or me or people doing things in their own strength. And that basically leads to self independent uh, you know, it's like independence from God, self-righteousness, stuff like that. Now, I don't want to highlight too much about sin, but the very core of sin is not about primarily, okay? It's primarily not about doing something wrong. It is not about committing acts of sin. It starts off at the root and the root is always not trusting God. Like if you go to back to the Garden uh, of Eden, it talks about how Adam and Eve, they hid because of what they did right and why did they uh, what was the root of what they did god said don't eat of the fruit the enemy came and said eat of it you will not die god said you will die they believed the lie instead of believing what god said and that was the root that caused them to eat of the fruit so when we are literally talking about sin it's talking about being independent of god first where god is not a part of your life which causes you to deal with life and do things in your own understanding, in your own strength, and that leads to all sorts of mayhem and chaos in a person's life, and you, nobody wants that kind of stuff. So, coming back to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, first it's, uh, in 1 John 3 6, it says, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Here it says, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What is his seed? His seed is the word. His seed is the fruit of the spirit. The spirit himself. When we have, are in oneness with the Holy Spirit, in communion with the, uh, with the spirit, like it says in, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So now in our mind, we are thinking like, you know, it's like, uh, I should not sin. People of the world or Christians in general, generally always think, you know, I don't want to sin. I don't want to do something wrong. I don't want to live a life, you know, that is unholy or not pleasing to God. And they always equate their holiness or, you know, it's like their life pleasing to God with their performance or their doing, whatever they do, their lifestyle, the way they live. And they equate their performance and their lifestyle with God being pleased with them, right? Now, as far as God is concerned, he is not primarily concerned with what you do or what you don't do okay he is more interested in you being his son you coming into relationship with him you knowing him you understanding him and that relationship takes care of everything that you do a person whether he does or does not do is not something that god is primarily looking at right he's not looking at to fault find in a person's life he is a god of relationship he's our father so as far as god is concerned He's not looking to, you know, it's like, see what you're doing right or see what you're doing wrong. The moment we come into relationship with him, all that starts taking care of itself. 
all the doings and the not doings, the do's and don'ts, all that starts taking care of itself. Why is that? Because the relationship is something that bears fruit. The, uh, from the relationship is where life proceeds. And God wants us to come back into relationship with him because that is the most important thing. If you see back in the garden again, God fellowship with Adam in the cool of the day. Now, why did he fellowship with Adam in the cool of the day? Why did he come to meet with Adam? Why not just create man and let him do his own thing? It's because man was supposed to rule and have dominion. And that rule and dominion was supposed to be a byproduct, a fruit, an overflow of the relationship that he had with God. So you see that, you know, it's like after man, you know, it's like ate of the fruit and his eyes were opened and stuff like that. Everything went down south from there. Why? Because that relationship got severed. And that, that kind of like, uh, that was the crux of the whole uh, downfall, right? So when it comes to sin, we need to understand that doing uh, or not doing, committing sin or not committing sin is something that God is not really concerned about. What he is more concerned about is the relationship. So go back to the relationship with your father because that changes everything. Now see what it says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. It says, For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You must have heard uh, so many people say stuff like, you know, uh, I mean, quoting from the Bible, okay? In this world, you will have trouble, right? And generally, they stop there. Because that's the only thing that is so prominent and it identifies with them. People, they, they see the problems in their life. They see the problems in other, li other people's lives. And they are all about the, you know, it's like problems. Problems are the most prominent thing. But what the scripture goes on to say is that, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. That's the most important part. The world always had trouble right from the time of Adam. And after the fall, there was trouble right from the get-go. And when Jesus came, he came to undo everything that Adam did. So you and I will never have to deal with the world's problems ever again. Why? Because you and I are, are taken out of this world, are set at the right hand of our Father, made citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we are not of this world anymore. So as far as you and I are concerned, we don't have a reality of problems because problems don't exist in the kingdom that we are living in. Right? Get it out of your mind that you have a life full of problems. Jesus said very clearly, he said, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, I have defeated the world, I have made the world obsolete. No, he didn't say that. What he said is, I have overcome the world. In other words, that the world no longer has anything on me. It cannot influence me. Why? Because my reality and your reality now is far greater than the reality the world is living in. See, before Jesus came, the world had no hope. You and I would have not had any hope. Why? Because it's like we were living in the world and there was no savior to clear our conscience and bring us into the power of being a conqueror. But now that we are in, in the kingdom, now that we are born again, now that we are sons, uh, it's not that now that we are sons, now that we have come to the knowledge of sonship, okay, we are now overcomers and more than conquerors. So this world has absolutely nothing on you and me. We are more than conquerors. We are powerful beings. So when it says we are overcomers and what has overcome this world, it is our faith. Why is it saying our faith? Our faith, as far as the old man was concerned, was not sufficient for anything. But see what it says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, I am living by Jesus' faith now. So my faith is not my old man faith. It's not the faith I had before, which was not sufficient for anything. Because if that faith was sufficient, then Jesus would not have needed to come and overcome the world for us. But Jesus came, he overcame the world and he gave us his faith. Our faith was, dealt, was removed, taken out of the way in the old man that was nailed to the cross. The new man has the faith of Jesus. In other words, your faith and my faith is now the faith of Christ. So our faith is what overcomes the world today. In other words, today, if you look at the world and you know the things that are happening in this world today, you don't have to pay attention and say, oh my God, it can happen to me. You don't have to you know, think about how it can affect you. You know why? 
because your faith is the faith of Jesus. If it didn't affect Jesus when he was in the boat and there was a storm all around him, when people were out to kill him and everyone was against him, he didn't bother. You know why? Because he had a faith that was of heaven. That's the same faith that you and I have. The faith that overcomes everything that this world shows us. So we are living by that faith, right? The first thing we need to understand is that we are born of God, right? What does it mean to be born of God? Born of God means that the seed that has now given birth to our life, the new birth, is the spirit of God. We have the DNA of our father now through Jesus and our life is that of an overcomer. So we are living the life that Jesus lived exactly, ditto, word to word, life to life, glory to glory. Like it says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, as he is, so are we in this world, right? In this world. So as far as you and I are concerned, we are like, you know, we are exactly as Jesus is. The new man, the, the firstborn, and you and I are the first, uh, uh, you and I are born exactly as he is. Exactly as the firstborn is. The new man, he's the prototype, and we are exactly as he is, right? See what it says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God does not sin, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that the wicked one cannot touch him. This is a scripture of revelation more than anything else, right? If I were to tell you, you know, it's like, you can't be touched, you know, it's like, you are invincible, you are indestructible, nothing can hurt you, nothing can touch you. Now, that's my word against everything that you are going through. For example, if you are going through hardship in your life, or you're going through some sort of a trouble, I'll say, I mean, uh, I'm quoting the scripture right now, right? And if even if I was not quoting the scripture, and I had told you that you are indestructible, nothing can touch you, nothing can affect you, but you're going through something in your life that you know, okay, fine, I'm already affected. I'm already going through it. What exactly do you, do you mean? What are you talking about? Right? In your mind, you, you must be thinking that, you know, it's like, this does not make sense. One of the first things we need to understand is that this is telling us, the brain is telling us it does not make sense. You know why? Because the brain is looking at all your circumstances. It's analyzing. It is seeing how real it is, how tangible it is. And it is telling you that what this person is saying is doesn't make sense. Because I'm going through it. Here's the deal. You are not this brain first, primarily. This brain is only supposed to receive information. This brain is supposed to be told what to think. Who you are is the person inside. And you have the mind of Christ. That mind in which your conscience is, that mind has to give information to this brain, telling it that you are a son of God, you are a life-giving spirit, you are indestructible, and you are invincible. So who's supposed to give you revelation? The re where does the revelation come from? It comes from who you are in the spirit. It comes from who you are by identity as a son of God. Now as a son of God, you have complete perfection. You are in complete perfection and you are 100% invincible and indestructible. Now that is who you are by nature. But your brain is telling you a different story because it is getting information from the world around you and getting information from your life. You're not supposed to be, you and I are not supposed to pay attention to what our brain is telling us. We are supposed to be receiving revelation from who we are by identity, from the spirit. Because our soul, which is receiving revelation from the spirit, is telling our brain, should be telling our brain, that you are indestructible. So, don't look at what is happening around you and say, you know, it's like, this is real. This is my life. This is what is going on. It's not real. It is only a product of what the world is trying to show you. It is a product of other people's belief systems. And you do not need to believe that, right? Your reality is the kingdom. And the kingdom, like Jesus said, is inside you. The kingdom of God is inside you. It's within you. That kingdom is your reality. So what are you supposed to do? Get revelation. Now, like I said, if I tell you, you know, you're indestructible, you're, you know, you're invincible, your brain is receiving that information because you're hearing the sound of my voice, okay? But it's not real. It will only become real when the Holy Spirit makes it a revelation in your being. When you know it to be true, that is when it will become real. And, it'll become, and when that reality strikes 
when your brain catches up with that reality, nothing of this world, nothing that is around you, no circumstances, what you may be going through, nothing can change your mind about who you are. That is what God wants. That is why he sent Jesus in the flesh. That is why Jesus came and got crucified. You know, the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world. Now, if the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world, I'm talking about in the heavenly realms, why was it necessary for Jesus to come and die in the physical realm? It's because most people generally do not go by something that is in the spiritual realm, which they cannot get by revelation. They need to see it. It needs to be real to them. Now, as far as you and I are concerned, we know that Jesus died in the flesh. We, he died as the son of God. He died as the son of man. And his death is our life. Right? It is recorded for us. It is given to us as the truth. Now, we know that. And when the Holy Spirit bears witness of that in our being. Now, see. Someone comes and tells it to you. Okay, fine. You still have the choice. That's the gospel, right? Someone comes and gives you the gospel. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for your sin. You don't have to die. You don't have to, you know, it's like suffer. He died in your place and now you have eternal life. Now, again, that information has come here. But when the Holy Spirit bears witness of that information inside, in who you are, nothing can change that from the truth that you know. Nothing can change it. It is the truth. So the Holy Spirit bearing witness inside as a revelation, that is when you start believing. Until then, you still have a choice whether to believe it or not. So you find so many people, you know, it's like they hear the gospel. They know, okay, fine, you know, Jesus died for me. Yeah, okay, fine. All that. But they, just, they choose, okay, I don't want to believe right now. I don't want to believe it. It's okay. So they kind of like turn away and go, or they probably reject Christ. But you know what? The Bible calls that a seed. The seed is sown. And when the Holy Spirit makes that seed and pops it open, and when he makes that seed a revelation, that person will come to the knowledge of God and nothing will be able to change his mind about what Jesus did for him. Revelation must change everything, not what someone is saying. I can, I can scream Jesus and I can, you know, it's like, tell you how amazing you are till the cows come home. But unless you believe for yourself and know as the truth that this is what Jesus did, this is what who I am, this is my identity, it won't affect anything in your life. It won't change your life. It won't change your mind at all. Right? God wants to make that a reality in your life and he'll only do it through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to become one with us so that we live everything that he says in our being. That is the relationship God has with us today. We are now hidden with Christ in God. We are at his right hand. We are one with him. Right? See what it says in uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead who is in you is also the very life of your mortal bodies. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is also that same life that is rejuvenating, regenerating every cell and every DNA strand of your body. In other words, you now have life by the spirit of God in you. Now, he's not just talking this. I mean, when you read scriptures like this, it's talking about your body. Yes, but the Holy Spirit is not limited only to your body. He's talking about everything that has to do with you. He's talking about your mind, the thought, your thought process, your oneness with creation, your oneness with the Father, your oneness with Jesus. He's talking about every single thing that pertains to life and godliness. He's talking about every single thing that pertains to you as a son of God. Your being, complete rejuvenation in life. There is nothing in you that is of decay and death anymore. You know why? Because you have the spirit of life that was in Christ Jesus is now in you and me. How can you have death and life happening at the same time? That does not make sense. How can you have light in darkness and darkness in light? You will either have one or the other. So you can't have both happening at the same time. Either you are in life or you are in death. One of the two. If you are in eternal life, there is no such thing as death. It does not exist. Right? 
that is the that is the gospel we have that is the gospel we have called we are called to believe and how can we believe such thing uh, such a thing only when we are open to what the holy spirit wants to show us now it may not seem logical up here okay because this is a very logical place it goes only by physical information and physical information is always getting is is always coming from the world around you which person do you know that is still alive for more than 100 or 100 maybe 200 years how many people do you know so your brain has already decided that you're going to die it's already decided that it's already telling you you're going to die why because you can't find evidence of anyone living for more than 100 years or more than 200 years right but god does not want us to go by what the world is showing us he doesn't want us to go by what the world is telling us in timothy it says jesus through the gospel brought life and immortality to light for us by his spirit right and it says here it, it, i mean paul is bearing witness again he says that the same spirit is is the life of our mortal bodies so everything that was taken away from man has been destroyed at the cross it does not exist in your life it doesn't exist in my life don't go by what the logic is saying don't go by what your brain is telling you or what people of the world say or what the world is going through it does not matter what is happening around you what does matter is your identity and who you are in Christ and where your reality lies you are in the kingdom you are in the father hidden with Christ in God that's your reality stick to your reality don't change it don't waver don't go to the left or to the right because that reality that you stick to will become your life if you think of every other possibility you are giving in to all those realities and it will become your life don't give in to any other reality except what you know to be true amen something that the holy spirit is saying is what i mean right what god wants to put in your heart make that your reality primarily okay so Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 it says for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life now this was paul giving the gospel to the roman church which he had never met okay he was still on his way there and before he could reach there he sent them the gospel so he could prepare them about everything that he had been preaching to the gentiles okay the the book of romans is a progressive book it is starts from the beginning about how humanity and mankind had fallen and the state of man and then it goes on to what god did and through through jesus and how sin was dealt with there's no condemnation now and it goes on so it's a progressive book it's a book outlining the entire gospel so when he says this in romans chapter 5 he is still coming to the part where jesus is now going to come die for man and there will be no condemnation but rejuvenation and reincarnation and you know it's a like resurrection of life right that is what he went on to go on and say so when it says over here that we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life we are saved by his life because jesus said in john chapter 6 uh, he says he who believes in the son has eternal life not going to have eternal life has eternal life in other words the moment you know that you are one with christ that you are one with jesus that you have the spirit of life in you you are in eternal life because the spirit is your life he is your life so now that you are in the father and you are in eternal life there is nothing can that can take away from who you are there is nothing that can take away from you you are a son of god and you are complete in him like it says in colossians chapter 2 and verse 10 don't believe anything else don't believe anything that people say people tell you negative things people tell you everything that is opposite to eternal life or life of god god wants you to know that you are in life because he does not want you to be conscious of death in any way shape or form he wants you to be living in the abundance of life jesus came to give us the abundance of life and that's where you and i live today in the father abundance of life no one comes to the father except through me i am the way the truth and the life there you go right so we are in life stick to that life do not budge from what your father says because your father is not the god of death he's the god of life he is life he's not the god of sickness 
He is the God of perfection, perfect health. He is not the God of poverty. He is the God of wealth. He is the God of riches. He is the God of sustenance. He is the God of provision. He is your father who will completely sustain you because of who he is, independent of who you are or what you do or what you think. It does not matter to him. He is your father and he will always stay a true and perfect father. What you do can't change who he is. Right? That's who he is. He's the father. He's, he's love. He's pure love. It says God is love. Amen.